so sick of this. It's been two years. I just don't get it. Well, I'm so glad to have all of you with us today at all of our live churches and our network churches and our church on, online family. Well, we're in the middle of a series called Why? And we're wrestling with different why questions that so many people ask about God. Uh, for example, last week we uh, let God's Word speak to uh, a very common why question that so many Christians have, and that is, why don't I always feel God's presence? Next week, we're going to talk about what, quite honestly, might be the most commonly asked question, maybe in the history of the world, uh, that pertains to God, and it falls within the genre of, why doesn't God seem fair? Or some people may ask it this way, why do bad things happen to good people? Have any of you ever wondered something like that in your life? All of our campuses lift up your hands. If you have or know somebody that has, next week would be a great week to bring them to church. And then the fourth week, we're going to talk about uh, why would God use someone like me? With all of my problems, all of my doubts, all of my fears, all of my insecurities, all of my sinfulness, why would God use someone like me to make a difference in this world? Today, though, we're going to talk about one of the more commonly asked questions by those who pray, those who are Christians, and that's the question, why didn't God answer my prayer? If you've prayed a lot, if you're a person of faith, chances are at some point you asked God to do something that you knew God could, you thought he should, he didn't, and if you're like a lot of people, it rattled your faith, and you're wondering, why didn't God do what I asked him to do? Especially in light of some verses in the Bible like this one. John 14, verses 13 and 14 says, uh, Jesus said, I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. You read a verse like that, and you think, well, I ask in the name of Jesus, and I know God could, and he didn't do it. And then I read about other stories in the Bible, like Joshua, who prayed that the sun would stand still, and it did for a day and Daniel in the lion's den with hungry lions everywhere, and he prayed and hungry lions went on a diet. <laughs> and Jonah, who got thrown into an ocean, and he prays, and God sends a giant fish who swallows him up, carries him safely to shore, vomits him up on the shore, and you're reading all this going, they prayed and things like that happened, and I prayed, and nothing happened. Why didn't God answer my prayer. How many of you have ever asked a question similar to that at some point in your life? A lot of us have. Uh, um, so often I tell the, uh, the faith building answered prayer stories because God has answered so many prayers that I've prayed and many of you have prayed really in supernatural ways, but I don't always tell the unanswered prayer stories. I'll tell you a couple today. One's uh, not that big of a deal. The other one is more personal to me. Uh, one time I got asked to pray for a, uh, a football game. It was a little private school, a little Christian school, and uh, I just did the, you know, the prayer before the game, which should have been a really easy prayer for God to answer. It's kind of the everybody prays it, you know, God keep everybody, you know, safe and ha let them play with good sportsmanship and ah, da 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 And I prayed, and the only time in the history of this school before halftime when um, the field goal kicker was attempting a field goal, a defensive lineman broke through the offensive line, uh, jumped on the kicker, snapped his leg in half. It was so violent that both sides of the bench cleared into this massive brawl. People leaving from the crowd were trying to get into this fight, and at this Christian school, they had to call off the game before it was even finished, and I want you to know, that's what happens when your pastor prays <laughs> before a football game. It's no wonder I've never been invited back. You know, why didn't God answer my prayer? Now, something that's uh, a little more personal to me and, and is kind of annoying, uh, a little over a year ago, 
I injured my arm for the first time, and then a few months later, I actually ruptured uh, the tendon playing tennis. And it's, uh, I've been seeing the best doctors, I've been to the best physical therapist, I've had everybody in the world praying, 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 praying. Uh, it's, it, when I preach, I don't feel it because the adrenaline goes, but then afterwards it aches and I have to wear a little arm guard and I can't shake hands. I can maybe do shake one hand or two, but after that, uh, it hurts really badly that I, I can't sleep at night because I roll over and such. And the doctors say, well, I don't know why it's not healing. It should be healing. We've done everything we know to get it to heal. And the irony is, I can't tell you how many times I've had my little arm guard with my little pain patches laying hands on someone, asking God to heal them of cancer or something really big, wondering if they're going, but God didn't even answer your prayer for your little boo-boo on your arm. <laughs> and in my mind, sometimes I'm asking, why, God, why didn't you answer my prayer? The reality is for so many of you, you've got things much bigger than a football game gone bad or a little sore arm, but you might have prayed for someone um, that they would be healed of some sort of a disease or illness, and then they weren't, and you knew God could do it, and God didn't do it. Or you might have been praying for someone to conceive, and, and, and they still couldn't have children. Or maybe you prayed for your parents not to get divorced, and you just begged God, please, oh God, let my parents stay together. And, and you prayed, and they ended up in this brutal, ugly divorce, and your life has been complicated ever since. Or maybe for you, you prayed for someone to come to know Christ, and the harder you prayed, it seems like the, the further away they got from him. And you end up asking the question, why, God, did you not answer my prayer? What I want to do today is I want to try to bring some possible biblical reasons as to why God didn't answer all of our prayers. And just like every week in this series, I have to say very cl clearly, I can't bring definitive and specific answers to every single example. I would be crazy and borderline arrogant to try to do so. But what I want to do is I want to raise some potential biblical reasons as to why maybe... God didn't answer some of our prayers. So let's look at four different possible reasons as to why God didn't answer our prayer. The first one is this. You're asking, why didn't God answer my prayer? Well, first of all, maybe it's because you have a broken relationship. Maybe you have a broken relationship, and some of you are saying, huh? What in the world does that have to do with prayer? Well, let me show you a couple of verses, one that speaks to this indirectly, the other speaks very, very directly, and what we're going to see as we look at multiple different scriptures and stories is that our horizontal relationships very much matter and impact our vertical relationship. Our relationships with other people very much matter in our relationship with God. Let's look at the words of Jesus in Mark 11, verse 24 and 25. Jesus said, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in what? Everybody, let's say it aloud. Whatever you ask for in prayer. So what are we talking about? We're talking about, it's not a trick question. You're like, oh, I'm not saying that. What are we talking about? Come on, somebody, we're talking about prayer. The subject is prayer. It, it, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe you have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand what? When you stand praying, what are we talking about? We're talking about prayer. When you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, if you've got a, a damaged relationship, you should forgive that person so your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. Now, wait a minute. Jesus is talking about you praying, and then suddenly he says, if you've got a horizontal relationship that's not right, let's deal with that first as you're praying to me. Where else would Scripture talk about something like this? Well, 1 John says this. The Bible says very clearly, you cannot say you love God if you hate your brother. You can't go around giving all this, oh, I love God, I love God, and yet I hate every single one of those no good, low down, pathetic people. God says your horizontal relationships impact your vertical relationship. Where else does Scripture say it? You can read about this in Matthew 5. Jesus said, if you're going to go to the altar to offer your gift, in other words, you're, you're coming to, to give something as an act of worship, but you get to the altar and then you remember, hey, wait a minute, I'm mad at somebody. If you remember you have something against someone, 
This is what Jesus said. He said, leave your gift at the altar first, Go and reconcile the relationship, make it right, then come back and give your gift at the altar because our horizontal relationships impact our vertical relationships. And honestly, I don't know how much, I can't you know, say, well, you know, what level of angry, you know, like I'm irritated at the jerk at work, does that mean my prayer? You know, I can't, I can't answer that, but I, I can kind of put myself in our Heavenly Father's position and think to myself, whenever all six of my kids are in the back of the Suburban, and they're asking for something and yet they're fighting. I don't wanna give them what they're asking for, why? Because they're, they're fighting. Hey, cut that out, kids, don't you know? Just, you know, oh, boom, 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 boom. Like, do what my sister and I did, put an invisible force field up between you and then don't pierce the force field. You know, just don't touch each other. And then, Daddy, let's get some ice cream. And you know, ah, he hit me, he's touching me. You know, no, I'm not getting ice cream because you're fighting. And before long, when the fighting continues, I start making threats like my dad, which is don't you make me pull this car over. And then if it goes on, I just start swatting. I mean, I'm just back any, I don't know who's there. I don't care who I get. Just like, give me some flesh, somebody is gonna get hit, I, you know, a hand, a butt, whatever, I mean, just, just give me something to hit. And they're thinking, we're not getting ice cream as long as you're fighting because me as the father, I care about how they treat one another. And to some level or another, scripture seems to be pretty clear that our relationships matter in prayer. Now those are all indirect examples. Let me show you a real direct example. I don't know if you've ever known um, kind of a Mr. Spiritual guy who acts all spiritual in some places and then is a jerk at home. You know, he's a praise the Lord, hallelujah, I'm a Sunday school teacher teaching through the book of Revelation at my church. And then he goes home and he's a total first class arrogant jerk to his wife uh, and kids. Here's what scripture says that kind of behavior will do to your prayer life. Scripture says this, 1 Peter 3, 7. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with what? We should treat our wives with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life. What's one of the reasons? Here's what the Bible says. So that nothing will hinder your prayers. Why? Didn't God answer my prayer? Well, maybe you have a broken relationship. Second possible reason, if you're taking notes, is maybe you have the wrong motives when you pray. Maybe you've got the wrong motives. James 4, 3 says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with what? Everybody, let's do it together. Because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. Can anybody say lottery baby? Right? He's like, I don't know how many people are praying, God, help me win the lottery. Help me, oh God, help me win the lottery. Oh God, help me in Jesus' name. If I just win this, I'll give 10% to the church, I promise. And someone else said, no, I'll give 12%. Someone's crying, I'll give 50%, God. Oh, think of how much good I could do if I gave 50% of the lottery to the church. And God may say, you're praying with the wrong motives. Okay? The Pharisees did this all the time. All the time. The Pharisees would stand out on the street corner and they go, hey, watch this. Oh, Heavenly Father, you're so good. And they'd pray long and loud, showy prayers because they were praying for the applaud of people and not for genuine hearts before God. I don't know how you would do that, but I'll be real honest. When I was in college, I prayed some self-centered, wrong motive prayers when I was looking for a Christian girl to date that was really cute. And I didn't know any that would go out and be really cute, so I just picked the hottest looking non-Christian girl and started praying for her. God, just help me lead her to Christ in Jesus' name. Give me the opportunity to, and so I went up to her like, hey, you wanna talk about Jesus? And she's like, get away from me, you freak. I'm like, God, why didn't you answer my prayer? And maybe you're praying with the wrong motives. Now, you may say, but my motives are right, my motives are pure. You know, I'm, I'm praying for my favorite football team to win because I got a hundred bucks on it and I need him to win. You know, I, I, sometimes we're not so clear on what our motives really are. Again, I can't judge the motives, but God can. And here's what scripture says, Proverbs 16, two. All a man's ways seem innocent to him, but what is weighed by the Lord? Scripture said, but 
motives are weighed by the Lord. Why didn't God answer my prayer? Well, maybe I have a broken relationship. Maybe I have impure motives. Uh, the third thing is maybe you don't believe God will do it. Maybe you don't really believe that God is going to answer your prayer. And I want to be real careful dealing with this because I need to be, but I, I, I think that we'll make some progress talking about this. Uh, Mark chapter 9 uh, is a really important story about a dad who had a son that was possessed with an evil spirit. Now, anyone who's a parent can know just the trauma, the emotional burden this would give them. And so this dad's like, man, I'll do anything. Jesus comes around, and the guy's like, hey, Jesus, if you can do anything about this, man, please do. And we see how Jesus responds to this, verse 22 of Mark 9. The dad says, but if, everybody say if. The dad says, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus seems maybe offended or perhaps hurt, I'm not sure, but he says, if you can, everything is possible for whom? He says, everything is possible for him who believes. Everything is possible for him who believes. Now, I want to be really careful here, and, and I want to say this. Your faith matters when you pray. It does. Over and over again, Jesus says, it was done unto them according to their faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. If you have a little bit of faith, you can say to this mountain, be removed. Your faith matters. It matters. The challenge is there are a lot of people who call themselves Christians who really don't believe God is going to do anything when they pray. It's like the pastor and the bar owner in an old classic story. The uh, pastor was upset because there was a bar down the street selling alcohol, the devil's drink. And so the, the pastor had prayer meetings to pray against the bar and prayed against the bar. And one day lightning struck the bar and it burned to the ground. So the bar owner sued the church. And when they were standing before the judge, the judge said, what happened? And the bar owner said, this pastor prayed, and because of his prayers, God struck us. And the pastor said, no, 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 we didn't mean anything by that. It was just a harmless prayer meeting. That's not why lightning struck. It's not our fault. And the bar owner said, yes, it is. And the judge looked and said, I can't believe what I'm hearing. Here we have a bar owner that believes in the power of prayer and a pastor who doesn't. <laughs> right? How often... Do we have people who call themselves Christians who don't really believe in the power of prayer? The reason I know they don't is because you can hear it in their language. You know, well, it's really bad. We've done everything we can do. Now, all we can do is pray. pray. Oh, it's that bad. Now, <laughs> now you just can depend on God. Man, you're in big trouble now. You've tried everything that's going to work, and they don't really believe in the power of, of prayer. Now, here's what I'm not saying. In, in the Christian world, this won't mean anything to some of you, but some of you it will. There's a teaching that's, that's um, often been called like word-faith teaching, and that means if you, just, if you just say the words and you just believe, and if you have enough faith, God's got to do whatever you say. For example, if you're a single guy and there's a cute Christian girl and you name her and claim her in Jesus' name, then she's got to say yes to you even if you're really, really weird. Okay? And that, that's what people tend to believe. You know, if I just pray enough and have faith for healing, then God's got to do it. Let me just remind you, God is not your cosmic sugar daddy. Okay? God is not there to serve us. We're there to serve him. If people get all upset. You know, I prayed for Grandma, you know, Braden, but she'd be healed. And, you know, she was 99, and she did, God didn't heal her. Like, she's 99. Okay? She's got to die sometime. It's been proven. One out of one people die. It's a fact. It's just, it's, it's going to happen. You can do yoga. You can do Pilates. You, you can eat organic food. You're still going to die. You're just going to die with a nasty taste in your mouth, but you're going <laughs> to die eventually. And all the people all said this happened and this happened. And, and here's, here's what I, I want to say, and I want to be really clear, is that just because you have all this faith doesn't mean that God's got to do it. But at the same time, I want to say, your faith does matter. It does matter. And I can't explain all the nuances of that. That's something only God can. But maybe God didn't answer your prayer because you're kind of half-hearted and you really didn't think he could. Scripture again talks about this in uh, ch chapter 1 of James, verse 6 and 7, uh, speaking about wisdom. When a person asks for wisdom, what must he do? He must, he must believe and not doubt. 
because he who doubts is like the wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. Why didn't God answer my prayer? Well, maybe I've got some relationships that aren't where God wants them to be. Or maybe my motives aren't quite pure. Or maybe I don't really have faith to believe God would do it. Now, some of you might right now, you're probably doing what I was do- would be doing if I'm listening to this. I'm going, okay, so at that time I did pray. Uh, I think my relationships were, were good as far as I know. Uh, I think as far as I can tell, my motives were, were right on this. And I really did believe God could and would do it. Why didn't God answer my prayer. Well, the fourth reason, if you're taking notes, is this. Maybe God had something different. Maybe God had something different. And I hope you know that God's will matters more than our will. His will really matters. Even though we may think we know what's best, even though in our mind this is the right thing, God's will matters matters. And we have confidence in this. 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says, this is the confidence we have. Those of you who are Christians, when you pray, you pray with this confidence. This is the confidence that you have in approaching God. That if we ask anything, what? Everybody say it aloud. This is important. If we ask anything according to his will, say it again. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. I love this, that we have the confidence of knowing if we ask anything according to his will, then he hears us and we will have what we ask of him. We have the confidence to know if we're asking God for something outside of his will, even though we believe it's best, even though we believe it's right, even though we're certain this is what God should do. He loves us enough not to give us something that is not according to his will. And this is huge. This isn't just pastor talk. This is absolutely huge. In fact, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, if you know who he was and know his story, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. If there is anyone that God should have answered all of his prayers, in my opinion, it was the Apostle Paul all day long, one who suffered and suffered righteously and served God faithfully. And yet, if you read his story, he said, I have this thorn in my side, and we don't know what it was. Some people guess and have um, some ideas, but we don't know what the thorn was. And he said, I pleaded with the Lord three times. And what that means is, man, I sought the Lord, and I prayed, and I begged over and over and again. And God did not do what I knew he could do, didn't do what I thought he should do. Instead, God did something different that was not Paul's plan, wasn't Paul's idea, wasn't what Paul would have ever picked. And God said, in my sovereignty, in this case, I want you to learn that my grace is enough. My grace is sufficient for you. And in whatever way, that would have done something supernatural in Paul that would have empowered him to become the person that God created him to be. Paul would have not liked that answer. He wanted it healed, but God had something different for him that was in God's sovereign plan and goodness. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, One is, Uh, In the early years of the church, we started this church uh, in 1996 with a handful of people in a two-car garage. Then we moved into an elementary school and then in in a bike factory. And finally, after several years, we were able, I mean, we like mortgaged our houses and took money out of retirement and did this crazy, stupid stuff. I'd never recommend to build the biggest uh, little building we could afford. And and before long, we were full in three services, then four, then five, then six, then seven. I was preaching seven times a week and I was being worn out. We were turning people away. And I kept praying, God, give us the resource to build a big enough building. Everybody in town, they're doing like one or two services. We got all these people. We had money with people with resources and ability. And the more I prayed, the more it was obvious God wasn't going to do it. Like, God, just a big, you know, it would solve so many problems. God, please, this makes sense. You don't want us turning people away. And I begged and I pleaded and I prayed and I fasted and I prayed. And we were sacrificing big time and God obviously wouldn't do it. And I was so upset. And as I look back now, I'm like, oh, God, 
I see. Because you said no to that, you forced us to ask the question, what if we did church in two locations instead of one, and that no back then empowered us to today to do church in dozens of locations, literally hundreds, including network churches and places all over the world that wouldn't have been possible if God had given me exactly what I knew he needed to do, okay? That's a gift that I can look back and see his hand and his love that in his mercy, he said no to something I knew he should have done so I could see something I wouldn't see otherwise. I thank God for his love to say no. Now, give you a more personal example. Uh, About nine years ago, uh, my wife, uh, her brother, David, was 34 years of age at the time, Christmas Eve, went into um, the hospital for uh, a real serious sickness that he had. We prayed and prayed like crazy, prayed and prayed like crazy, prayed and prayed like crazy that God would heal him, and we saw God heal people in much worse condition than David was, and about three weeks later, God didn't heal him according to um, the way we prayed, and Amy's brother died at the age of 34. Honestly, it's almost embarrassing for me to say, but I thought, okay, God, you know, after all I'm doing for you, why wouldn't you just do that for me? It's embarrassing to say, but that's kind of what I thought. Like, you know, hey, we're doing, you know, if you're going to do it for anybody, aren't you going to do it for those who are really trying to make a difference for you? What's up with this God? And as best I could, I went and did the, the uh, helps with the funeral. And I invited people to know the Christ that had set David free from uh, his sinful lifestyle and be transformed. And, and, and um, so many people came to Christ. It was stunning. It was stunning. One of them was Amy's uncle, Uncle Blue, who we had prayed for for years, and uh, there was like no sign, and he, he was like miraculously transformed and is now a very active part of our church, strong Christian, and there were so, I mean, I'm talking about how in the world did God change so many lives through this one 34-year-old kid? I, I have no idea. I asked Amy, several years went by, I said, babe, if, um, if you could undo all that God did to have your brother back, would you undo it? Um, to get him back. And she didn't even hesitate. She said, no, 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 no. She said, we'll be together in heaven again before long. This life's a blank. Said, After all God did, there's no way I would undo that to have my brother back. And I just remember it just hit me again like it has a million times before. No matter what I want, God is still good. He really is. He really, really is. He really, I'm telling you, He really, really is. You hurt, you're disappointed, I understand, okay? I do, I understand. And I'm here to tell you, he's good, and he's good. Let me me summarize it this way and then we'll pray. What do I believe about prayer? Let me tell you what, let me just tell you what I believe about prayer. Prayer reminds me that I'm not in control and it keeps me close to the one who is. Baby, that was good preaching. I'm going to say it again, okay? I want you to hear this. Prayer reminds me, I'm not in control. It's not about me. I'm not in control, and it keeps me close to the one who is. Prayer is not so much about my wants as it is God's will. It's not, God, do what I want, do what I want, do what I want, do what I want, do what I want. As much as it is getting to know God, I mean, the fact that the God of the universe gives me access to him, to know him through prayer, is one of the most difficult things even for my finite mind to even comprehend. Um, Any time that I pray and something doesn't go the way I want, or, or there's a big prayer need that I have, I try to think of this story, and maybe this will speak to you. Daniel chapter 3 uh, talks about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, three teenage boys that stood before the evil king Nebuchadnezzar who said, bow down and worship my God, renounce your God, or I'm throwing you into the fiery furnace. And these boys facing death. Okay, we're talking real problems. Not a sore arm, we're talking real problems. Here's what they said. They said, hey, if we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is what? I want everybody to say it aloud. The God we serve is able to save us from it. And he what? He will rescue us. He is able and he will. He is able and he will. He is able and he will. But even if he doesn't, 
We will not serve your gods. So you want to know what I believe about prayer. Every time I pray to God, write this down, I believe God can. I believe all things are possible with God, and he can answer my prayer. I believe God will. I believe he is a good God who desires to bless his children. I believe he can. I believe he will. But even if he doesn't, I still believe. Even if he doesn't, I still believe. And I thank you for that kind of polite clap from a third of you or so. The rest of you, when you know him like I do, you, you'll stand up and worship him because I'm telling you, he is that good. He is that good. He is that good. I believe, I'm telling you, you pray big, I believe he can. And I believe he will. And even if he doesn't, oh my goodness, I still believe. Father, I pray that you would build the faith of your church today. God, I pray that, that, that we would seek you in prayer. God, that our faith would grow. And God, for those who are hurting uh, over some uh, disappointment, I pray there would be healing in their hearts today. As you're praying to all of our churches, um, I want to see a show of hands, uh, honestly, of those who prayed for something and it didn't work out the way you thought it should and it rattled you. Would you lift up your hands right now? Just lift them up. And man, there's so many. I want to see the hands of those of you who are praying for something significant right now in your life and you really want to see God act. Would you lift up your hands right now? Lift up your hands. Man, I hope every Christian has a hand raised because we should always be praying big. God, I pray for the first group. God, I, I know there are so many that are, that are hurting or confused or disappointed because you didn't do what we know you could do and thought you should do. And God, I pray for some that have the gift that I've had of looking back over the, the months or the years and saying, oh, yeah, I, I, I wish it hadn't gone that way, but now that it did, God, I see your hand in it. And God, even if we never receive that gift of perspective on this earth, God, I pray that we would know your goodness, that we would trust you. God, no matter what, I pray we would trust you. God, I pray today that for those who have a significant need, a challenge, a burden, I pray, God, as, as they lift their hearts to you in prayer, you would build their faith. God, I pray for miracles and physical healing. God, I know you're a, you're a healing God. I pray for uh, healing in relationships, God. God, I pray for spiritual breakthroughs. I pray for salvations of those that don't know you. God, I pray that as we're a praying church, that our faith would grow. And God, we would believe you can. We do, God, and we believe you will. And God, even if you don't do what we think you should do, God, we still believe. We still believe. As you keep praying today at all of our different churches, uh, I'm guessing there are a lot of you that at some point in your life you prayed for something and it didn't happen, and, and that kind of, in a way, built a wedge between you and and God and spiritual things. You're like, I'm not sure I can trust this. I don't know. And, and, and since then, you haven't wholly put your trust in God. I want to tell you, I'm really glad you're here today because I believe it's in the heart and the purpose of God that you're here because I believe he wants to do a healing work. Some of you, that hurt has kept you from fully trusting in God. Right now, you may be even aware of that. And I want to tell you about a, a prayer that God always answers. When you seek him, when you ask him to show himself to you, he always will show himself to you. When you pray to him for forgiveness, he will always forgive your sins. When you call on his son Jesus, who was born without sin, who became sin for us on the cross, who died and rose again, when you call and ask him to save you, he will always hear your prayer and forgive your sins and make you new. And I believe there are those of you, you may have been hurt in the past or, or disappointed in some way, but you're here today because it's time to trust him, to trust him with all, to trust him with forgiveness, to trust him with your past and your present and your future, to trust him with your whole heart, to give your lives wholly and completely to him. And that's why you're here. All of our churches, you know it, you sin it. It's time to call on him to forgive you. He will. To give your heart to him. You can trust him to surrender your life to him. He is a good God who wants to guide you and to bless you even when you don't understand it. All of our different churches, those of you who would say, that's why I'm here. I'm ready. I'm ready to give my life to him. I need his forgiveness. I need his grace. I want his 
his presence. It's no longer about me. Today, I give my life to him. That's your prayer. Would you lift your hands high right now? Just lift them up high all over the place. I just want to see your hands, both hands right here in this middle section, right here. God bless you guys. Right back over here, over here on this side section, right up here. Sweetheart, God bless you. Right back over here on this edge, sir, right here. I don't know how you guys are being quiet right now. Right here, ma'am, right here as well. You guys at Church Online, you click right below me, back here in this middle section, back here, both of you here in this section, say, yes, Jesus, take my sins, save me, make me brand new, way back over here, and right back here toward the back. Praise God for all of you. Would you all just pray aloud with those around you? Everybody join your voices together. Pray, pray Heavenly Father, save me from all my sins. Make me new, I believe. Jesus died for me so I could live for you. Today I give you my life, all of it, my past, my present, and my future. Thank you for new life. It's my honor to give mine to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Life Church, would you take a moment? Would you celebrate? Would you worship God? Thank him for new life in Christ.